Okay, <clears throat> here we are again. And uh, well, this is composition one, of course. <clears throat> this is week four. I have made a decision about this class to delay the in-person lectures two more weeks. And that is because I don't think it's there's a huge difference between you studying for writing uh, online and in the class. Uh, so not being in a room, which I've been told we don't have any other options, there's a fairly small room for us to use upstairs. And our class is on Monday. There's other classes at the same time. Um, so we there's not a bigger room available. So this is what we have to work with. So I think it would be wise of us to delay <clears throat> a couple more weeks. So that would be until week six. Then on week seven, we will start having class in person, just like my other classes. But until then, uh, we can continue to do it like this. If you have a particularly strong opinion about doing in-person class, please email me and let me know. If you're fine, with uh, what we're doing right now with these recorded lectures, then you don't need to say anything or you can email me. Um, let me know what you think. If you don't say anything, I will assume that everything's fine, that you're doing your homework and you understand. If you have any questions, contact me this week uh, and I'll deal with them, okay? No problem. So but anyway, that's what I'm gonna do. Just uh, some other professors have done the same thing. Um, my class, my large class of 55, if you're, some of you are in that British and American culture class, it's staying online too, because there's uh, too many, that's a lot of people and Omicron spreads very easily. So the more people you have and the smaller the space, the higher the chance that somebody's going to infect us. So for to be on the safe side, we'll delay another couple of weeks. So this um, class is gonna be online uh, until, like I said, middle of April. And then if everything's improving, it seems like the cases are starting to peak. I'm, I'm not gonna say for sure, but since you do, some of you take my British and American culture class, let me use a, a, a quote from Sir, Sir Winston Churchill. He said, November 10th, 1942, <clears throat> in World War II, um, when Germany started to be bogged down in Russia and they had won, uh, the, the British had won the Battle of Britain, essentially. Um, the attacks on, on um, the United Kingdom had been turned away and uh, they secured air power over their own country, over the United Kingdom. He said, <clears throat> let me quote him, Exactly. Where are you, Winston? <clears throat> he's, he's a master of rhetoric, this guy. This is one of the reasons I'm mentioning it. Not just because most of you are in the other class, but also because rhetoric, the way that you say something, it's an entire branch of English literature. It's a, uh, not English literature, but just humanities. You can, you can do a PhD in rhetoric, which is the, the thing that Socrates used to always do. How you say something, how you argue, how you put words together in order to be, to have an effect, to persuade people or deter people or argue something uh, or change um, to communicate, <clears throat> that, that is what rhetoric is. It's a, it's a word style. So um, Winston Churchill is famous for saying many things. This is one of them. He said on November 10th, 1942, now this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Important part. Now to understand this turn of phrase, <clears throat> uh, it might in your second language 
sort of give you a headache. But essentially, the length of time, really what we're talking about, is this is the beginning, right? World War II goes from 1941, and we know it's 1945 now, but nobody knew when the end is going to be. So he's just saying this is the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. So this is progress. Don't get me wrong. Winston Churchill is saying this is good. Um, Germany's starting to lose, but it's starting to new lose. It's not. We're not close to the end. There is this much left to go. Now you may know. I'm not going to get political about uh, this, but um, you may know that Russia has invaded the Ukraine, which is, you know, people are afraid, have been afraid since it started. That there's a possibility of it getting bigger into some World War Three type fight with multiple countries joining on Russia's side and Ukraine's side. This this has happened before. It happened many times in Europe, not just World War Two or World War One, but in the, in the case of other conflicts that, you know, everybody's allied on one side or the other. So if Belarus starts helping Russia and Kazakhstan starts helping Russia and other countries, I won't say any more countries' names, but that's what happened in World War One and World War Two. happened in, in Napoleon's, the wars that Napoleon fought. There's alliances uh, between countries and then you end up with this huge conflict. What's happening right now in, in Russia is a similar thing, that the Russian attacks have been stopped and perhaps this is the end of the beginning. But it's not the beginning of the, probably not. It's probably going to continue for a while. And um, that's what that phrase means. We can apply that phrase also to the co coronavirus. You know, people keep saying, oh, you know, in a few months, you'll be taking your masks off. Or in a few months, we won't have to get booster shots anymore. Well, the coronavirus is, Omicron's better. Omicron's better than Alpha and Delta. So, you know, it's not, though. In, in Korea, it's not. Uh, I didn't know anybody in Korea who had gotten coronavirus. Now, everybody I, I know. All of my brother's friends, uh, all of my brother's friends. That's true, too. My brother has gotten it. My sister has gotten it. One in Canada, one in another country. They've got, they've been in, their whole family has gotten it already. Um, I have friends in Canada, their fam, but in Korea I didn't know anybody. Now my son's friends, all of them and their families have had it. <clears throat> which means, um, which means once you know everybody's got it, like the chances of you getting it again if you're vaccinated and you've caught it and uh, you've recovered then it's going to spread less. So this might be the beginning. This might be the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. We don't know. Uh, nobody knows. Once the coronavirus is gone, maybe next year or maybe five years from now, then we will be able to say. Okay, <clears throat> sorry about that. I accidentally re erased my title. Normally, in regu one of the things about regular class compared to these kinds of videos is that I talk continuously for 30 minutes in this video. It's, it's a whole hour and a half compressed into this video, and I don't take any breaks. Right there, when I was writing and not talking about something, I just realized that, you know, I barely take a breath when I give you these lectures. So remember, although there's 30 minutes of lecture, like in terms of time, I don't stop, I don't sit down or anything. I just talk to you for 30 minutes straight. So it's actually in a normal lecture, an hour, an hour and a half, because I, I do in real, when I'm in the classroom, I'm not gonna talk like a motor mouth for 30 minutes like this. So that there will be a difference and that will probably be refreshing for you because I'm coming at you 30 minutes without stopping and you have to concentrate. But lucky for you, you can press pause. I can't press pause for 30 minutes, I gotta keep going, but you can just press pause and like go get a drink, you know, and keep going. But you may notice, I rarely, I rarely even take a drink of water. I just try and do the whole lecture as fast as possible. But I needed a drink there. <clears throat> okay, so 
to our topic for today, recognizing writing. What I'm doing right now when I, when you get this kind of poetry from Winston, Winston Churchill, that's why his rhetoric was so famous. He, he had a certain way of expressing things that was really masterful. And personally, or, or like his beliefs or whatever, these are totally different things. Winston Churchill was uh, sort of old school British imperialist. Yeah, he drank all the time. He loved alcohol. He usually drank alcohol for breakfast. He used to call, you know, his morning drink. I think he had some sort of cocktail or brandy in the morning after breakfast. And he called it his mouthwash. Mouthwash is actually a rinse, you know, that makes your breath fresh. And like he would have a, he would have some liquor. And he smoked cigars all the time. If you see a picture of Winston Churchill, he was always smoking a cigar. And he was always drinking. <clears throat> um, so anyway, but he, he, he had the ability to sway millions of people with uh, the, the way he talked. Like when, when he comes to America and he speaks to Congress to persuade the Americans to join the war, he just gets, he does his speech and like, there's just people standing and clapping like, over and over, he gets standing ovations for his speeches. Um, you don't see that. You don't see um, American politicians standing up and giving um, standing ovations to anybody who speaks, you know, especially not all of them. You look at the videos, it's pretty amazing what he can do. That's the power of language. And uh, Churchill knew how to use the English language to uh, affect history. <clears throat> he also said, I'm sure history will be kind to me because I'm the one who's going to write it. Because <laughs> he was a, a historian. He did write books. And there is a book that he published um, called The End of the Beginning. <clears throat> it was published in 1943. So while he was uh, you know, busy, he was dictating and writing books at the same time while he was winning World War II. It's a crazy person. Anyway... Uh, we don't need to be that ambitious with our writing, but writing is extremely useful. And to be good at it is a very beneficial thing. And English is the most popular language in the world. So English writing, therefore, English writing is my rhetoric, right? Therefore, we should practice English writing. We said this already. What is the paragraph? Uh, they say, their definition here is six to 12 to uh, sentences about one topic. Every sentence in the paragraph is about the same topic. You're not supposed to repeat yourself, but you're supposed to be talking about one thing. You're not supposed to go off and talk about Winston Churchill and the Russian war Ukraine and then come back to English writing. If you're writing a paragraph, the paragraph has to be just about English writing. Don't write the way I teach. Here's my first piece of advice. When I write essays, when I write paragraphs, I do not talk about random things. I talk about that are uh, have weak connections to them. But I try to relate uh, my, my t discussion about writing to real life, to your life, to Korea, to what's happening right now, and to history. That's why I talk about those things, because they're interesting and they're supposed to motivate you. But when you do a paragraph, Writing is a different thing. I'm speaking and I'm presenting and I'm lecturing and I'm bringing things in from my experience and my knowledge in order to explain things to you. You can do that too, but you have to be careful because really, if, if I talked like this, I should stay with Churchill for the whole lecture if that's gonna be my paragraph. Don't do a paragraph about English writing and mention Churchill. Write an entire paragraph about Churchill rhetoric and writing if that's what you're gonna do. My topic is English, how Churchill's rhetoric is a beneficial way of writing. That's my topic for my paragraph, good. Talk about that, don't mention Russia, Ukraine, don't mention COVID, don't mention Omicron, don't mention other things. Just do that and write your 10, 10 12, 15 sentences, <clears throat> something like that about that topic and then conclude. That's how you do it. So all of the sentences explain the main idea, not the sub subtopics, right? When the writer wants to write more about a new main idea, then you begin another paragraph. <clears throat> you 
In academic writing, a paragraph has a topic sentence and supporting sentences and a concluding, concluding sentence. So it must have those three things. Topic sentence, supporting sentences, concluding sentences. It must be on the same thing. All the sentences must be related to the main idea. So this is the advice here. The when you're reading a paragraph, you must recognize, you must recognize what is good writing. And you can't just say, you can't just say it's good or bad. That's not enough. You have to be specific. And how do you specifically argue that something is good or bad? Well, you give reasons, you would say, why is it bad? Be specific. Tell me exactly what is wrong with this paragraph. And then I can agree. These are some of the things to look for. The sentences are not about the same topic. There's not enough sentences. There's no topic sentence. Or some sentences say the same thing. In, in other words, they repeat. Now, I told you about the three C's, remember? Clear, concise, and coherent. Though you don't have to memorize these rules. They're principles that you have to use every time you're writing. When you're judging your writing or somebody else's, that's what you need to do. If you say, <clears throat> if you say, if you say it's not clear, <clears throat> because this sentence, uh, I, I can't understand it. The sentence doesn't make sense. Uh, it's not, it's too general, right? That's related. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, there is grammar problems with that sentence. Uh, it, it's talking about two things that are not related. Um, <clears throat> this is all related to clarity. This is, so it's, it's got the information in it doesn't provide enough information. That's what not being clear means, right? So you can say this if, when you look at a paragraph, it's your own writing or, or on the exam or in the textbook, when you look at these paragraphs, you have to be able to know, is this, is what's the problem with this paragraph, right? Um, so you need to give me the reason. You need to say what the problem is. You don't need to fix it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna ask you to, to fix it at this case, in this case, but when we get to the exam, you should be able to do it. The first step is knowing there's a problem, then how to fix it will come afterwards. So what you're looking for is, in a, in a general sense, um, there's missing parts. You can say this in different ways. There's missing parts, right? In other words, it's incomplete. The first thing I'm gonna look for when you write, when you do your uh, response papers and you write for me, the first thing I'm gonna look for is whether it's complete. Does it have a topic sentence? Are there support? Is this, is this the structure? Do you have the structure or not? That's a simple question. It's the first thing I'm gonna check. Is there a topic sentence or not? Yes. Is there supporting sentences? Yes. Concluding sentence, yes. That's the first thing. Then I'm gonna look at the content more carefully and the organization. But those are the three basic things. And if they're not there, then, then you're going to lose points. Okay, so you can say it a variety of ways. You can say it the way they write in the, in the book. You can say it, it's not concise, it's too long, it's got too much information. <clears throat> and you can say that things are not connected to each other, like you're going off topic and you're not staying on the main idea. It's the same thing. You can explain it however you want. Uh, I don't care, you don't have to memorize these things like rules. You just have to know these are the, the things that you should do or should not do. <clears throat> so, paragraph. The first paragraph on A, it's a number 11 in chapter, which I think we're still in chapter one. <clears throat> uh, 11A in chapter one on page nine. <clears throat> this is where I'm getting this information from. The first paragraph says, it's important for me to get a job working with other people. I'm a, a social person and work is more enjoyable when I'm with friends. In addition, talking with other people helps me think better and more creatively. I'm an, a more effective worker when I can work with others and a happier worker too. 
So we got one, two, three, four sentences. That's always going to be a red flag when um, a piece of writing is that short. Like I said, the shortest possible paragraph is really three sentences, but they recommend six here and this is four. If you hand in something that's four sentences long, you're not gonna get a good grade because there's just not enough there. The, the next paragraph also is similar. They're very short sentences. Um, not this one, the next sentence. I should not get ahead of myself. A, that one I just read. The sentence length are fine. There's only four of them though. Is there a topic sentence and is there a concluding sentence? I'm a more effective worker when I can work with others and a happier worker too. That's not related to the topic sentence. A concluding sentence should be related to the topic sentence. It should come back and confirm or reaffirm what you said at the beginning. You have to restate it in a different way. Don't repeat it, but say something that's very closely related so that <clears throat> your topic sentence comes, your first sentence, your topic sentence comes back right, right back to the beginning. So it's like a circle. You do all of your argument and you come back. All your support should come back in the end. You should end up where you started, right? So you're going to restate, confirm, Right? Like, like I said at the beginning, this is my point. Reaffirm. Reaffirm that original statement, that original main idea, come back to it, and then you're done. Does that happen in this one? No, it doesn't. It's important for me to get a job working with other people. That could be a topic sentence. Nothing really wrong with that, except maybe you could specify what exactly the reason is. If it's related to happiness, then maybe that should be part of your talk. You're gonna talk about how to be happy at work. Is that your paragraph? Then that should be in the, the first sentence. That should be part of your topic sentence. So you, your topic sentence there could be more specific, but the biggest problem is it's not long enough and there's no concluding sentence. So this paragraph is no good. Not surprisingly, there's, they're, they're not showing you perfect paragraphs. They're trying to show you what not to do here. So you gotta be like a detective and figure out what's missing. So B <clears throat> also continues on, I need to buy a motorcycle. <clears throat> With a motorcycle, I could get my job more quickly. It takes two hours to get to work by bus. That's very slow. A motorcycle is much faster. If I had a motorcycle, I could save a lot of time. Taking the bus is not as fast, not fast enough for me. Okay, I need to buy a motorcycle. Why? They say, I need to buy a motorcycle to get to work or something, or because I don't have enough time. I need to be more efficient, so I'll buy a motorcycle. But <clears throat> um, what, is it, what is it about a motorcycle? Um, it's, it's better than a bus, okay? So this is a comparative paragraph. It's going back and forth. <clears throat> bus is slow, motorcycle fast. This is comparison. There's nothing about a bus. Why are we talking about buses? Why aren't we talking about walking? Or why aren't we talking about cars, airplanes, helicopters, bicycles? You can't, if you're gonna compare buses and, and motorcycles, then you have to state it. There has to be a topic statement. Uh, that, that, that has to be in your topic sentence. You can't just suddenly start comparing to buses. <clears throat> so the whole thing, but the, the other thing is, this is kind of rambling. This is kind of, this is incoherent. This particular paragraph has a problem where the person is just like, oh, I have another idea and another idea. And they're just going off. I did have a point. I, I prepared the, the quote of Winston Churchill before my lecture. I was going to talk about coronavirus in Russia. I had a plan to do that, but it doesn't really matter if you have a plan or not. It, but it sounds like this person is free writing. That's what it looks like. It, the person just said, well, okay, what am I gonna write about? I'm gonna write about motorcycles. Ah, uh, motorcycles are fast, but I don't have one right now. I take the bus to work. Buses are slow. You see how it's just like ideas are just 
popping. This is like associ free association. It's like a psychological interview. And that's if you write like that, that's that's not good for an academic piece of writing. Um, it's interesting. It's train of thought, right? This is basically. <clears throat> it's train of thought. It's almost like stream of consciousness uh, kind of stuff. I'm, I'm taking, a, you know, a class in my PhD um, studies. The seminar is on Virginia Woolf. And uh, you know, James Joyce also writes this way, where like the, you just kind of listen to what the character is thinking. And they, they might think about something from a long time ago and then might see something in the newspaper and then they might look up at an airplane and then another thought might come into their head and then, then they like bump into somebody and then, you know, um, past and future and present get all mixed up in the person's head. Um, not that there's past and present or anything like this, but this sounds like a person that's just going from jumping from one idea to another. You don't want to do that because it, it's harder to read. Right. And if you're doing it for creative purposes and it's a trying to show how the human mind works in, in a Mrs. Dalloway or Dubliners or Ulysses, that is a great piece of writing. And I'm not saying you don't can't write like that. But if you write an email like this or you write an essay like this, it's going to give somebody a headache and the, the, you're not going to get the point across. Right. So don't write like this. These sentences are too short. You can't be like, it takes two hours to get to work by bus, period. That's very slow, period. That's not a good sentence, right? Very rarely, I'm, you could be super concise. In your title, you probably only want to have three or four words. In your title, when you write something and you think of a really good title, there's this thing in English called the rule of three. Things come in groups of three, like triangles. It's like a, a natural shape. It's a natural number. The, um, the Romans loved threes. It's called the rule of three. You got three little pigs and you got, you know, three leaders of the, of the end of the, the old Republic, um, <clears throat> three branches of government. So there's just threes everywhere. And it doesn't mean that three is a magic number or anything, but, but take a look, take a look at the branding of, of American companies. What, how many, how many words are in these catchphrases, right? LG, LG's catchphrase, life is good, three words. Nike, one of the most famous catchphrases of all time. What does Nike say? Just do it, just do it, right? Sprite, impossible is nothing. McDonald's, I'm loving it. Can I think of any other examples off the top of my head? Uh, maybe not, but the, you know, um, uh, there is a, there's a frequency of two, three, war, uh, two, three, four words uh, is enough for a title just to give something a label. That's why brands, companies brand, right? Um, Coca-Cola, always Coca-Cola. That's two words. I mean, Coca-Cola kind of sounds like two words, so it's like three, but always Coca-Cola is two words. This is just how, it, in some cases, being very concise is good. In a title, in a brand, in a catchphrase, that's good. Less is more. So you do that in your sentences. When you're building sentences to explain something, be specific, don't be general, don't be short, don't be be general, okay? be specific and detailed. And you don't need a you know, super long sentence with 45 words in it, but 10, 10 words, it's good, okay? Now, the next page, I did the first two for you. So this is, I'm not gonna give you homework every week, but I do, this is very important and we are, it's important for your process when you're doing your own writing and it's going to be on the exam. So I am gonna ask you to do page 10, all right? C, D, E, F. So all you have to do, it's not a big homework assignment, it's only gonna take you 10 minutes at most, I think. 
uh, all you have to do is 11 C D E F It's page 10 and I want you just to answer, but you have to give a reason. You can say this paragraph is not good because give your reason, provide a reason, make your judgment. If this is weak or strong, you don't even need to say good or bad. That's probably not the best way to, do, to say it. <clears throat> I'll change my rhetoric. Okay. Don't say good, bad. I actually always remind my students, this is the way I grade. This is the way, there's, there's no such thing as garbage writing or perfect writing. Uh, there's no such thing as that. I might give you a hundred on some assignments, but when I grade your paper, you're just gonna get, you're gonna get a grade like a letter. A, a plus, A minus, B plus, B minus. That's, I'm not gonna give you a 100 or 96 or 85. It's just letters because that's the way you have to judge writing. It's in a category. It's in the strong category or it's in the weak strong, weak category, right? So tell me why the paragraph is strong or tell me why it's weak, okay? Be specific and give me reasons. There's only four to look at and uh, I'll post, I'll post uh, you know, the assignments up on the website as I usually do, okay? And that, that's it. So just a quick reminder, we're still gonna be online. If you're in my conversation classes, and we're switching next week, but this class will continue for another two weeks. Okay, thank you for listening. And again, if you have any concerns, the best thing to do is send me an email, tell me what's on your mind, okay? Okay, have a good week. See you next Monday.